Hi, my name's Laura McPhee Brown, and um, today I'm going to read uh, two chapters from my book. It's called Cherry Beach. Got it up. Um, as you can see in the background, that's actually um, a painting of the cover. Um, it's painted by Emma Curry. She's a Melbourne artist, and it's just absolutely beautiful painting for the front of the book. So I thought I'd sit here so you could see it. Um, Cherry Beach was published by Tex Publishing uh, earlier this year and um, yeah, reading this for the lockdown reading group for Read Tasmania. Let's start with chapter, uh, the chapter called Mouth on page 55. Mouth, the place where the river flows into the sea. As the weeks in Toronto passed, it felt like everyone around me was touching and kissing and lying in bed together. Marjorie was full of new relationships blooming, or old ones reigniting after too many beers at Ronnie's on a Thursday. Steph started inviting over a guy called Morris, who had curled hair and thick arms with meaty hands at their ends. Clark introduced us one morning in the kitchen to his new girlfriend, Isabel who was so beautiful she was almost annoying. One night after there had been people and drink in the courtyard, I walked into the bathroom to find Steph and Clark entangled. They both told me later that they weren't getting back together, that they were with Morris and Isabel now, and it had only been the alcohol. I'd never even known about the together part and felt I had no right to an opinion. Minnie even had someone who started coming to see her on her lunch break, which she had started taking. His name was Paul, and he was very tall and awkward, and made her cheeks turn the colour of a Roncesvalles Route Avenue sunset. I stayed me, barely touching my own vagina, not admitting what really made it swell, what caused that flicker in my pelvis to thrash not letting myself have a crush on anyone for fear of who the anyone might turn out to be, watching everyone around me dive, dive deep. The few boys and then girls I had in my bed through the years before we went to Canada had Hetty's lips and Hetty's lines and arches in the dark, and I let them. I suppose I was in love with her, but I tried to pretend it didn't matter. And I succeeded, mostly. She didn't know, because I knew she didn't feel the same way, and I was scared she would try to. So I hid it and encouraged myself to deny it. Like a sickly feeling in your gut that you try to pretend isn't the beginning of food poisoning. Hetty's boyfriend, Sean, had known. He used to watch me when I would watch her, the furtive pauses I would let myself take. And I heard him yelling at Hetty once that I had a thing for her. It was so fucking obvious that she was an idiot not to see it. Hetty had told him to shut up. <clears throat> and then they had closed her bedroom door. And I could only hear muffled voices followed by muffled sobs, followed later by muffled moans. I hated that he could see something about me that I had tried to keep hidden. It was like he'd come across me naked and had laughed at the right vulnerability of me without my clothes. I didn't want to have a relationship with anyone and I definitely didn't want one with Hetty because I knew it would be a disaster and my heart would end up even more cloistered than it already was. I decided on the nights when I let myself think about it that I would be that woman who didn't need anyone. It seemed like I might be able to pull it off, that I could base myself on an old friend of my mum's who had been called, who had called herself Juniper and wore colourful smocks and amethyst stones to take the focus off her loneliness. It wasn't true anyway, really, that she had been lonely. Juniper seemed like one of the most content people I knew. Even her walk was more purposeful, her gait more free than those in relationships around her. Couples were weird. That had always been very obvious to me. 
the happier the work they were, the more weird, the more room they took up with all their private specialness, alienating themselves and everyone around them. A few weeks after Hetty had visited Cafe Art Song with Elaine, I made myself cross the road after my shift and walk through the heavy doors of the art gallery for my first visit. No one looked at me when I got inside, in my black jeans and sweatshirt. I smelt a little like bread or milk or sugar and cheese, something dense like pasta. But it didn't seem busy in there and I felt safe in the sound of not many people. I walked around and up the sinuous walkway that led to the ticketing desk and breathed long, deep breaths as I felt the design of the building lean on me. It was beautiful inside as well as out, like the National Gallery in Melbourne with its streaming water wall that made you feel like you were wet from swimming or a water fight when you looked at it, and the grey fort body of the gallery that stood behind. The woman at the ticket counter told me I could wander the exhibition that dotted the building as I wished. It felt kind, the way she pressed the ticket into my hand, encouraging me gently. I left my bag in the cloakroom and set out under the wooden walkway ceiling that Frank, Frank Gehry had imagined, up the stairs to the second level. It felt special up there. And because there were not many other people, I felt as though I was in a film or a song, almost putting my hands out and closing my eyes to spin, spin my body around and around. There was a photography exhibition in the main gallery with its high walls and silent attendants standing in the corners of each room. I imagined they would have soaked in so much excess and metaphor and keenness and energy through their skin being around art all day, every day. I wondered if it started to get boring. There were beautiful photos all around me and I decided I would choose a favourite. <clears throat> Usually I did this with Hetty in galleries and we often chose the same piece. I was determined that day to do it all without her. It was the photo I stood in front of the longest that I chose a snapshot of a group of friends having a picnic on some grass next to dark blue rippled water. They were eating cake, the group of friends, and laughing at something. Some mouths were open, some were pinched into wry smiles. Each wore an outfit I imagined was their favourite, and there were no cleavages, just flat muscled chests, half covered by a dress or a pointed collar. I wanted to be part of a group like that. The water behind them was almost aqueous and they would have jumped in after finishing their cake after the photo was taken. It was a glorious picture, picnic on the Esplanade, Boston, the first time I saw a man golden. As I came back out of the photo, I noticed the weight of someone near me. I turned and saw standing behind me and to the left a small woman about my age with long wispy brown hair. She smiled when I turned and moved slightly away, perhaps shy. I turned back and felt myself blush. The woman was pale and possibly plain. She seemed to be nothing. But I could feel the skin of my face and neck was pink from looking, locking eyes with her. She shuffled behind me and I heard her footsteps as she walked away from me, onto the next photograph, then the one after that. I didn't want to turn, but I did need to know that she was leaving. I couldn't enjoy the art with someone unfamiliar on my skin. When I finally pulled away from the picnic and looked to where the woman had been, she was gone, and there was only the attendant standing near the door looking at the wall with his hands behind his back. I hoped I wouldn't see her again. I wanted to be the kind of person who went to look at art on their own, and didn't need or want to meet anyone. And I really felt like this was who I was on that day. Talking to someone interesting and trying to find the right words, linking what I was saying to what, I was, what was going on inside, seemed so far away from what I was trying to do. I kept standing long before each photograph, beginning to grasp that every photographer was American 
and that I loved most the images of friends or lovers where their eyes were on each other and the camera was an afterthought or not a thought at all. I decided to get my camera out and use it at Marjorie next time everyone was home and we were all sitting in the courtyard or the living room. The other part of the gallery I wanted to see was on the lower level. I walked slowly along the balcony that squared an open area full of light and stepped down the first staircase I saw. The Thompson collection was on permanent exhibit and I knew it included a few Emily Carr paintings. I had loved Emily Carr since I first started wanting to visit Canada for her paintings made of wild strokes and brave, thick colours. She painted trees and sky and clouds and grass like a vivid dream made real and I wanted to see a canvas she had touched. The photo I had seen of Carr in her later years, a large stern woman with thick eyebrows like mine, arms crossed before her, was wonderful to me. She wasn't elegant or apologetic. She was whole and fierce and unusual and she saw things in a way that she believed mattered. I could see that in her paintings. When I'd first discovered Emily Carr's paintings and learned as much as I could about her life, I told Hetty about her. Hetty was a good listener and could become enthusiastic about things that weren't hers. She appreciated every painting I showed her and loved that Carr had been an explorer, that she had travelled all over the world and stretched herself across Canada so that she could get the most authentic understanding of Indigenous Canadian life for her art. Hetty's favourite Emily Carr painting was Stumps and Sky because she said it could be anywhere, the scene of that painting, that it could be Australia, even though Carr had never been there. Stumps and Sky hung at the Art Gallery of Ontario and we had planned to come and see it together, but Hetty seemed to have forgotten and I didn't want to have to ask. So I would see it on my own and keep the experience for myself. I walked through the smaller rooms, muted with their bone-hued walls, watching out for it. There were many beautiful paintings, but I didn't want to stop at any of them in that moment. Finally, around the corner of what was possibly the last doorway, there she was. I walked over and stood just in front, glad to be the only one there. The painting was oily and the colours, blue, orange, forest, were brighter than they had been on the internet and the whooshing of the clouds, their curls and flurries were moving, was moving. I remembered hearing that Carr used expensive, good quality paint. She came from a family with money and must have thought it senseless not to use some of it for this purpose. Quality paint can last forever and stumps and sky looked like it could have been painted a week ago. The thing I had loved most about the painting when I first saw it was the rust orange colour of the dirt at the bottom of the scene. And standing in front of the real thing, it was still the best thing about it. I wondered again whether there were parts of Canada that had the same red dirt Australia had. Though I was sure this wasn't true, couldn't be true, and that I didn't even really want it to be. As I stood there, rolling my eyes over the up and down of the trees and the horizon, I heard the noise of someone behind me. I turned and saw it was the girl with the long brown hair. She was standing looking at a painting on the opposite wall of a man standing in the snow in a wooden coat, woolen coat with a dog next to him. And I took the time to see what she was wearing and leave my eyes on her a little longer. She had blue jeans on and a red and white striped top and stood compact, sure, like a dancer. I took a breath and let it out, then another. I made sure they were quiet, those breaths. I turned back towards Stump and Sky, Stumps and Sky, and wondered if she was as thoughtful as she seemed to be, standing there. I wondered whether she was wondering anything about me whether she had even realised I was the same person as the person she had seen before, up there in the wooden sky. Hi, I heard from behind me, a small, round voice, like a circle. 
I turned and saw her smiling. She wasn't plain at all, really. Rather, she was pretty in a noiseless way. Oh, hi, I answered, trying to stay as still as possible so I didn't go red or wobble my words in my throat. There wasn't enough time to think about what to say before I needed to say something else. Do you like Emily Carr? I hoped I didn't sound like I was trying to prove that I knew the name of an artist, but she smiled, revealing fingerprint dimples in both cheeks. Then she laughed. I don't know who Emily Carr is. Is that bad? Oh, no, no. Oh, no. She's the only artist I've ever known the name of, ever. It's just that this is a painting of hers. I pointed at Stumpson's guy. It's vivid blue and red. And I came to see it. She smiled again. She didn't seem to feel the need to say as much as me. But no, I repeated and then stopped, telling myself not to say anything else, even if the silence became unbearable, even if the air split in two. Oh, good, she said, making those dimples deeper. Her little hands were by her sides and I let myself look at her eyes. They were brown and curved like kidney beans. She walked to stand next to me and I turned back around and we both looked at the Emily Carr. This time I saw how carefully Carr had made the wind and the clouds look like the essence of wind and clouds and not just swirls of white paint and how there must have been the beginning or middle or ending of a storm on the day or night that she painted the scene. It's beautiful, she said, with certainty, and I nodded. It is. She told me her name was Faith, and I told her that my name was Ness. We stood in front of the Emily car, and she told me she hated her name. Her parents were born-again Christians and had her later than most people had children, after finding themselves able to, under the protective shadow of God. They had named her in honour of it all, and she thought that was concerning, as if she embodied something that wasn't real. I noticed that she had the lightest of dark circles under each of her kidney bean eyes. She looked at me squarely, carefully. Are you Australian? It was the first time since I'd arrived in Canada that someone had picked it. Yes, I said, and tried not to beam. What's it like there? she asked. It's big, so it's different all over. I'm from Melbourne, which I guess is kind of like here a bit, and it's cold sometimes there, but it gets really hot too. We have lots of bushfires. I didn't know it got cold in Australia. I don't know much about it actually, which is terrible. That's not terrible. There's much, not much to know about Australia. It's big and there aren't many people living there. Just a big selfish island. She laughed bigger this time and I heard a slight shriek at the end. I liked it when people had strange laughs. It was like a small bit of eccentricity that they usually hid was revealed every time they found something funny. You know that we're perpetually drunk there, yeah? She laughed and let out that small shriek again. Yes, I had heard that, so it's true, eh? I'm drunk right now. Her laugh made me want to kiss her, suddenly and overwhelmingly. She opened her mouth and closed her eyes and leaned her head back, and I saw the pale of her neck, just briefly. There seemed to be a smile she would make only after she laughed like that. It was a smile like she had more to let out but was too shy to. Her mouth held together tight and creased to stop it. I'd never walked through a gallery with someone like her. We looked at every painting in the Thompson collection and said things to each other about each one. When I looked at art with Hetty, she would always ask me to tell her what it was about. I would leave feeling exhausted, questioning every answer I had given, all of my understanding. Faith seemed to have ideas about what each artist had been trying to do, but she didn't sit within these thoughts like they were important. I felt myself spreading out around us, covering every piece with my eyes and my sticky fingers and the saliva trail of my tongue. 
When we finished and the gallery was closing and we seemed to be the last ones there except for the attendants still at their corners, drooping slightly, we walked together through the heavy glass and wood doors and stood awkwardly opposite each other at angles on the concrete outside. I could smell heat and light and Faith had a sheen on her skin and we laughed at each other with the corners of our mouths and our eyes. It was so nice to meet you, I said, my heart banging against my ribs. Oh, you too, she replied, her mouth curling slightly at one side. We agreed to meet again, this time face to face, sitting down across the table from one another. Faith said goodbye and I said goodbye, and I pulled myself away from her and walked down the steps to Beverly Street. I felt my heels kicking up slightly as I walked past Grange Park and down towards Shopper's Drug Mart. She was already making me move differently. I was green and lush inside. And I'm just going to read one more short chapter, a little bit further on in the book. It's called Wetland on page 103. Wetland, saturated land. I stayed at Faith's house after the beach and in the morning we woke up at almost the same time in her large lilac bed. She placed her hand down on me for a while and then I could see her silky leg there between my two legs, her silky head there between my two legs and I was nervous in a way that felt like floating. I could feel her tongue against my skin and we were both wetlands. Faith was so pretty that I didn't feel like I should do the same to her until she asked me to with a big voice that I hadn't heard from her before. She smelt different to how she had smelt at the beach. She could open up to me properly there in her room with the door closed and her bra around her belly where I had pulled it. I wanted to make her feel the way she was making me feel and my stomach was hot against her thigh. She came quickly and with that same different voice telling me yes. Afterwards, we lay on her pillows and I looked at her face with the light of the morning against it and let her look back at me, despite the fear. Faith made toast in the kitchen for our afternoon tea when we finally stood, giggling at each other and our must hair and all the raw parts of us. There was a collection of small pots of jam on her counter, an orange one, a yellow one, a red one with pink at its bottom. She spread all our slices with lemon butter and put one in her mouth to carry our coffee to the rug at the edge of the floor. I couldn't talk then because she was too perfect and I saw her little nude feet on the rug and when I sat down mine were twice the size and had short hairs at their ends and I was not worthy of her at all, all of a sudden. I felt like a giant slug. I wondered whether it was normal to want to say thank you so much and sorry, sorry, sorry and I'll go now, I'll never come back to the woman you've just made love to. She moved her head to the side as she watched me. You okay? Not really. I tried to joke but it came out sounding like how I felt inside, stewed and sad. It was too bright and warm. I could feel the beginning of sweat on my upper lip and between my breasts and I didn't want Faith to see it and regret ever touching me at all. I'm okay, I might just have a shower, I said and pulled myself up to standing again. She looked at me from way down on the rug, small and neat and worried. Ness, wait, sit here with me while we eat, she said, wretch reaching out her arms and clasping my fingers with hers. I sighed and lowered myself down again. I felt scared now, as if everything could go away very quickly and that I didn't deserve it to stay the way it was. I sat looking at my hands, cross-legged with my feet under my thighs so Faith wouldn't have to see them. I could feel her watching my face 
and I felt as if I might cry for no reason I could understand. Yes, she spoke softly, and I felt her fingers against my arm, stroking at my paleness. I wish, wished she would stop watching me and touching, or that it was night again. It felt safer to be watched at night because the shadows helped to hide some of me. I hated feeling like this and remembered why I'd never wanted a girlfriend in the first place. It was disgusting sitting there feeling so big and cornered. I knew now it wouldn't be long until she would reject me with her quiet kindness. It wasn't her fault I couldn't maintain things because I was too rough, too scared. I wished it was men I felt this way around instead of women. When I was with a man, I didn't care what my body looked like or whether I was slick or red or smelly. I just wanted to find any pleasure I could from the encounter and leave it without thought. Women, women meant more, so much more. I turned to her and let my face open. Maybe I could just tell her I was scared. I'd never done that before. She was the kindness, kindest, and this was the loveliest moment after all. I'm scared that if you see me in the light, you won't want me anymore, I said. I wiped the back of my hand, finally, against my upper lip and then my chin. The beads of sweat transferred from skin to skin. I hoped my face wasn't red. Faith's eyes turned down. No, she said. Oh, Ness, no. Sorry, I said, my lips barely moving. It was tiring being vulnerable and raw. I wished myself anywhere else, anywhere else alone, anywhere else where she wasn't, so I could be huge and ugly and sad without her beautiful eyes seeing me. She sighed and, shook and took my hand and put one hand on top of it and one hand underneath it and pressed lightly with each of them. You don't need to say sorry or be sorry. Thank you for telling me how you're feeling. I stayed looking down at my hand in between hers. It's how you feel now, but it's not realness. I am incredibly attracted to every part of you. I could feel her breath, her face and mouth close to my neck by then. She kissed my neck and each cheek. That part and this part, she said, then kissed my forehead. And this part, lifting my arm up from where it was pulled close against my side and kissing deep against my armpit. I let myself feel her lips and not worry about what she was touching when she touched me with them. And these parts, she said again, and kissed little kisses down the side of me and in to my belly button. Faith, you don't have to. I said. She shushed me and kept kissing until she was at my vagina and I let her show me over and over. Okay, that's all I'm going to read. Thank you for having me read Tasmania and Kate Harrison for asking me to read. Um, you can buy my book if you would like to, please do. Um, through text publishing. I think there'll be a link below this video. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. Take care, everyone.